thank you, uh, Jack and Kathy. Uh, some of us uh, who were here, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, when I, one of those uh, uh, icy Sundays, we got a preview as they were kind of practicing with just a handful of us here, and uh, uh, they've undoubtedly done a lot of work uh, since then because they just did. <laughs> Whatever I said, I wasn't trying to be a comedian. Uh, I, I wasn't meaning that they didn't do a good job before, but they said they were practicing and they did exactly. Also, since I've already done foolishly, I'll do foolishly again. Ryan, you don't need to clap subdued in times like that. Some of us don't clap because about the third clap, we get off beat and can't ever get straightened around. Those of you who are musically capable, you don't have to clap subdued. There just might be somebody else that would that join in. That's, uh, so, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, uh, however God leads you to uh, worship Him, you don't have to... You don't have to uh, uh, shy away from that. Amen. Would you pray with me? <laughs> Father, I thank you that even when I blunder, we can laugh and go on because we love each other and because you love us. We have been in your presence in a very special way in this communion moment, Lord Jesus. And now we wait in anticipation. breathless anticipation to hear the word that you would speak to us. I pray that I, that each of us would have ears to hear you speak and would respond in a way that would honor you. Thank you for what you did, Jesus, on the cross. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Over the centuries, uh, people have uh, found a great deal of comfort and encouragement in Jesus' seven I am statements recorded in the Gospel of John. Probably none of those uh, seven statements have brought as much solace, as much comfort, as much encouragement as the fourth of those that we will look at today, Jesus' statement about being the good shepherd. Maybe one reason that uh, would immediately come to mind, uh, especially to Christians, uh, as to why uh, that particular I am statement is so meaningful is uh, because uh, uh, when we hear Jesus talk about a shepherd, immediately it brings to mind that most beloved of the Psalms, the 23rd Psalm where David uh, declares the Lord is my shepherd. And then he immediately follows up with scenes of peace and tranquility and uh, safety. Uh, I shall not want, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. Uh, 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil because you're with me. We get uh, good pictures about shepherd. Last week, we looked at uh, a few of these same verses that we will look at this morning. Uh, but uh, in those, we considered Jesus' declaration uh, that, uh, about his role as the door or the gate for the sheep. But uh, as we hear his words today, uh, those words emphasize his role, not as the door, not as the gate, but rather as the shepherd of the sheep. Actually, the words that we'll read today, uh, he spoke on two different occasions. They were not uh, uh, far apart in time. They were very close together. Uh, uh, and it's clear that uh, he wanted to make sure that his listeners would understand the implications of himself as the shepherd, the good shepherd. Our text comes from the 10th uh, uh, chapter of the Gospel of John. I'd like to uh, read in your hearing, and uh, you may want to follow along in your scripture. Uh, I'd like to read those first uh, 30 verses. I know that that's uh, somewhat of a lengthy text, I pray that you will uh, stay engaged and listen to the words of Jesus. Very, very powerful. John chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. <coughs> But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, 
These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We're immediately confronted with a scene that uh, is pretty much unfamiliar to most of us today. We live in an area, we live in a culture where uh, we're much more likely to see a herd of cattle than we are a flock of sheep. Although I say that, and uh, many of you know that up there just on the south side of Branch, there's a, a, a family that has some sheep, and I noticed the other day they must have been lambing. There were a few new, new babies out there uh, following their mamas around. But... Uh, uh, for the most part, we're more familiar with cattle. And when you do see a flock of sheep, for the most part uh, in this area, uh, in this culture, they're handled kind of like cattle. By that I mean we, uh, we'll herd the sheep, we'll drive the sheep, we'll have a, a, a stock dog that'll, uh, uh, you know, kind of move the sheep where we want them. and and. Uh, uh, if we do have multiple flocks of sheep, we'll di distinguish between them by an ear tag, maybe a di maybe different colored ear tags for different uh, different flocks or something like that. Uh, not so. First century uh, Middle Eastern societies, and for the most part, the uh, 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 Middle Eastern societies are uh, uh, pretty much the same today as they were uh, 20, 21 centuries ago, especially in the way that they handle uh, sheep. There, you don't drive or herd sheep, you lead sheep. And uh, uh, there, you don't keep my sheep in one pasture and your sheep in another pasture. No, they're kind of uh, often handled in a, in a common or communal way. And right away that raises some questions. Uh, if the sheep are handled by leading them, how do you get them to follow you? And uh, another question, if my sheep and your sheep are handled together, how do we go about sorting them out? The answers to these and other questions <coughs> intrigue us as we hear Jesus describe four marvelous blessings entailed in his role as the good shepherd. The first is this. The shepherd has a personal, even an intimate relationship with his sheep. As best I understand it, can I uh, describe for you uh, uh, the Middle Eastern way of caring for sheep, in, whether it be in the first century or the 21st century? Each family, each shepherd has his own small flock. Uh, uh, in the daytime, you take your flock and you graze them in some pasture. Uh, uh, 
some meadow. Now, it may be quite a little ways away from the village or uh, where you live. Then in the evening, you bring them together, and those sheep, your sheep, my sheep, uh, somebody else's sheep, they're put together in some kind of a communal uh, type enclosure. Uh, often two or more, two, four, uh, even more uh, flocks in the same uh, uh, in the same enclosure, and uh, uh, the uh, access way to that enclosure is a singular door or gate, and somebody guards that. Somebody watches that uh, uh, until uh, all night until the next morning. Then the next morning, the problem arises. How do you sort out? Your sheep from my sheep. When I was in the cattle business uh, a number of years ago, in order to facilitate just such a problem, you know, sometimes cattle get into a different pasture and they get mixed up. So when I would get in a, a load of cattle, the very first thing that I would do is put those cattle through a chute and give them, of course, whatever shots were needed, but I'd put a brand on them. And uh, that uh, took care of any uh, questions about, you know, is this my steer, is this your steer, is this my heifer, is this your heifer? Uh, uh, but that's not the way you do it with sheep. Uh, instead, the shepherd has such a relationship with his sheep that he's got each one of them named. Now maybe when you were a kid or maybe some of your kids or grandkids have a, a, a sheep as a 4-H project or an FFA project or something like that. Of course you got that sheep named. But no, this, uh, this scene is maybe you got 20 sheep, maybe you got 30 sheep, however many you got. But they've all got names. But the relationship uh, is even closer than that. After all, if I'm a thief and a robber, and uh, if I want to take your sheep, if I just call them by name, all I got to do is get your sheep roll call list, and I can start calling your sheep and, uh, and take them. But no, 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 no. That's not what Jesus says. He says that they... You don't have to have merely the correct names, but the voice, the voice. Did you notice verse 5, what Jesus says? A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And then the shepherd doesn't go into the enclosure, into the sheepfold, and uh, get his sheep. Rather, he stands outside and he calls his sheep, and they hear the voice of the shepherd, they hear their names, and they respond and they follow the shepherd. He doesn't hurt them. He doesn't drive them. He leads them. He goes before them. Now that, seem, that may seem amazing to us. But it really is done this way. Would you listen to just a couple of brief accounts of people who have been equally amazed but have seen this take place? H.V. <coughs> Morton gives an account of this sort of thing. Early one morning, I saw an extraordinary sight, not far from Bethlehem. Two shepherds had evidently spent the night with their flocks in a cave. The sheep were all mixed together, and the time had come for the shepherds to go, to different, go in different directions. One of the shepherds stood some distance from the sheep and began to call. First one, then another. Then four or five animals ran toward him, and so on, until he had counted out his entire flock. Gerald Borchard is uh, a 
a Christian minister, a seminary professor, he writes these words. Having taught in Israel, two illustrations have become seared in my memory concerning eastern shepherds and their sheep. One of the two pictures, one is that of a shepherd leading his sheep through the city of Jerusalem just outside the Jaffa Gate. Cars were whizzing by while the shepherd <coughs> sang and gently whistled to his sheep and they dutifully followed him despite all the bustling traffic nearby. The other picture is that of an early morning with the Bedouin, Bedouins. When the shepherds began to lead their sheep out of the sheepfold, which contained the combined flocks of four shepherds. It, as each shepherd took his turn and began to sing and call his sheep, they dutifully separated from the larger flock and began to follow him for the hills for their daylight feeding. They know the voice of the shepherd. Into that understanding, into that relationship of a shepherd and his sheep, Jesus speaks these explosive words. Ego and me, the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. They're explosive because in using those words, I am, ego and me, Jesus is identifying himself with God the Father. That's God's personal name. And Jesus is taking it and saying it and saying, that's my name as well. But he's not merely the shepherd with all the closeness that that picture conveys. He is the good shepherd. And as that good shepherd in verse 14, he says, I know my own, and my own know me. Whether you're a first century listener or a 21st century listener, those words invite a close, personal, intimate relationship with the shepherd. Because when the Bible talks about knowing, God and Him knowing you. It's not just like, oh yeah, you meet somebody on the street or you meet somebody in the MFA. Oh yeah, I know you. No, no, no. That word is used in the Bible about Abraham knowing his wife in an intimate way. And Jesus says, I know my sheep that intimately, and they know me. He also makes clear that as part of that knowing, you recognize his voice. To know somebody like that, to recognize their voice out of a crowd, requires that you spend time with that person. The truth is, he knows you. He knows you by name. He knows everything about you. Do you know him? Do you know him as your good shepherd? Does he know you? Or have you kind of kept him at arm's distance? That personal, that intimate relationship with the good shepherd. 
But the blessing of Jesus as a shepherd does not end with that personal, intimate relationship, as precious as that is. The second blessing of Jesus' role as uh, shepherd <coughs> is uh, the inclusiveness, the scope of his flock. The size of his flock, if you will. <coughs> Verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep, and they will be part of this, uh, of this one flock. And uh, to those Jews who heard him speak, they would have thought, oh, he is talking about some people who aren't Jews, who are Gentiles. And from beginning to end, the message of the Bible is God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. To Jesus' immediate listeners in the first century, other sheep would have indicated non-Jews. Today, other sheep indicates people from every tribe, every language, every nation, every tongue. For you and me today, it means that Muslim terrorist who's filled with hatred for Christians. It means that child molester sentenced to life in prison with no parole. It means that shameless homosexual or lesbian. It means that neighbor who has only snide comments about Christ and the church and Christians. It means that indifferent person who just isn't concerned about religion, as he says. It means that international student down at MSU in Springfield, who has no clue who Jesus is. You see, Jesus has sheep that we might not like or even imagine. And if you are one of his sheep today, he calls you, he calls me to make known that there is a shepherd and he wants you to be one of his sheep. The truth is that Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 and 20, 18 through 20 are still there where Jesus says, you go and you make disciples of all people. Not only is the shepherd's flock bigger and more inclusive than we might imagine, but in him, in that shepherd, we find the offer of blessed security, marvelous security, verses 28 through 30. And the third blessing is just that. The third blessing of Jesus' role as the shepherd is that no one can snatch the sheep out of the hand of the good shepherd. No thief, no robber, no intruder. Jesus holds his sheep securely in his very own hand. That's not to restrict his sheep. It's to provide them safety and security. Uh, those beautiful words of the psalmist when he says in Psalm 139, you hem me in before and behind. You lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too marvelous for me to comprehend. It's like Jesus, he's got this, this protection in front and behind and over the security of being a sheep in the hand of the shepherd. 
The security is not merely for today and for tomorrow. The security is for all eternity. Uh, Jesus says in verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. The same writer, the Apostle John, writes in his first epistle that the reason he wrote it is so that you may know that you have eternal life. A word of caution, a word of warning when we think about the security found in the hand of the Good Shepherd. There is a constant biblical tension. On the one hand is security that is found in Christ and the Good Shepherd. On the other hand is the responsibility of every single person, every sheep, if you will, to be faithful. We must never minimize either aspect of that tension. That brings us to the fourth blessing of Jesus as the uh, good shepherd, and that's found in verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. In the first century, that was a very real possibility. The shepherd would take his sheep off to a remote pasture where they would graze for the day. There would often be marauding uh, critters, wolves, lions, whatever. When one saw that sheep that looked uh, uh, promising, easy prey, the caretaker, the one who was looking after the sheep, had a choice to make. Uh, he could run off and save himself, or he could try to save the sheep. Jesus said the hired man, he doesn't really care about the sheep, so he just uh, uh, runs off because he wants to protect himself. But the good shepherd, to whom every one of those sheep is precious, he's willing to risk his life. He's willing to confront at times, even to lay down his life <coughs> to save every one of those sheep. And notice, while the good shepherd would give his life for the sheep, Jesus goes further in verse 15 and says, He does give his life. I lay down my life for the sheep. That, that presents us with a little dilemma here because how is this uh, shepherd who promises to give to his sheep eternal life, how's he going to do that if he loses his own life? And the key is found in his words in verses 17 and 18. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Those who heard Jesus' words on that first day had no conception of what that would very soon entail. Very soon, he would go to Jerusalem. He would be screamed, he would be schemed against, he would be plotted against. One of his closest followers would betray him, another of his closest followers would deny him. He would be rejected by the very people that he wanted to bring into his flock. He would be lied about by false witnesses. He would be condemned by the Roman governor. He would be beaten. He would be mocked. And he would be nailed to a cross. Indeed he, for the sheep, would be bearing the sin of the world, the sin of every single person. 
For six hours he would hang on that cross. He would be taken down, as Tom reminded us in his communion meditation. He would be taken down at the ninth hour. He would be taken down dead and placed in a rock tomb. But true to his word, on the third day, he took up his life again. He arose never to die. And so the certainty of all of those other three blessings. We come now to the point where we must ask, so what? What does that have to do with me? And there's really only one question that matters at this moment. And that question could be phrased in one of two ways. One way is, is Jesus your shepherd? Or we can phrase the same question in another way. Are you one of Jesus' sheep? If you are, you will be enjoying a personal, intimate relationship. He knows you personally. And you know him even into Do you recognize his voice? Do you recognize his voice? Are you part of his worldwide flock of brothers and sisters from every tribe and language and people and nation? Do you have the security that you're safe in Jesus' hand for now and for all eternity. Is he your good shepherd? If not, he can be today. Put your faith and trust in him and what he did on the cross of Calvary. The blood he shed because he died for you. If he's not your shepherd, will you today commit your life to him? Will you repent of your sin? Will you confess his name? Will you contact his shed blood in the waters of baptism through Christian immersion? Have your sins washed away? Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The shepherd is speaking. He is calling ever so tenderly. Won't you be my sheep? If you are not, won't you respond to that loving call of the good shepherd this day? Our hymn decision number 326, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. If he's dealing with you, either about uh, your relationship with him, your need for a more intimate, personal, close relationship with him, your need to uh, be more concerned about those that he's calling, but they've never come into the flock. If he's dealing with you on any front with his uh, call necessitates a public response would you respond number 326 would you say <coughs>